as you just said, that's my name. Doesn't matter how you pronounce it. That's my logo, the Unibrow. <laughs> and uh, that's my company, Beta Zeta. Beta Zeta is a network of communities. We have 13 different vertical communities, and uh, we reach over 8 million people each month. We're based in Chile, but we have offices all around Latin America and in Spain as well. And that makes us the most popular network of our kind in Latin America and the second largest in the Spanish-speaking world. We have all these different vertical communities, and we call them communities, and we don't call them digital newspapers or digital magazines or even blogs because they mix a little bit of everything. They have text, they have video, they have audio. They are these hypermedia communities that just mix everything. And amongst them, we feature Firewire, which is currently uh, the most popular blog in Spanish in the whole world. But I want to start speaking about something else. We've been hearing lately, these past couple of years, first there was this craze about blogs, then everyone started talking about Web 2.0, and then they stopped mentioning those things because they were old-fashioned, and they start talking about new phrases. And now it's social media, it's not Web 2.0, it's not blogs. And the truth is, it's not one or another term, it's, it's a bigger phenomenon that's happening. And the correct way to describe that or the word that actually uh, summarizes all these different things that are happening is hyperconnectivity. Hyperconnectivity, according to the encyclopedia uh, description, according to Wikipedia, is a phenomenon computer networking in which all things that can communicate through a network will communicate through a network. Okay, so everything that can communicate will communicate through a network. But better than just reading the description, is understanding through examples. So, for example, my wife can upload a picture to, uh, through her digital camera uh, on her computer to Flickr. She can share that picture with me and I can see it on my cell phone. From that same cell phone, I send a text message to my business partner asking him about a meeting we're planning. He gets that text message, but from his phone, he answers through IM, through instant messaging or through, through chat, and says, yes, the meeting's confirmed, and oh, by the way, your sister just showed up on Twitter. My sister, who's traveling through Thailand, just tweeted, I'm in Thailand right now, I'm in Koh Phi Phi, everything's going fine, having lots of fun. And because Twitter is a real-time service, I know that she's online that same minute, so I reply, and I say, hey, why don't we get together for a video chat? A minute later, she's in a cyber cafe in Thailand. I'm in my office in Santiago, and we're doing a video conference, and uh, she's telling me how everything's going fine, traveling with her husband over there, everything's wonderful. And just before the conversation ends, she says, oh, I just uploaded a bunch of pictures to Flickr. So I call up my family and invite them over to dinner at my house, and after dinner, we sit on the sofa and on the TV, connected uh, to the internet, we're seeing those pictures on Flickr that my sister just uploaded uh, halfway around the world a couple of hours ago. After my family leaves, I send a message from that same TV to my friends through Facebook, and I say, hey guys, why don't, why don't we get together to have some beers? And that's what happens when we get together to have some beers. It might sound exaggerated, but actually some of these things actually did happen in that order. It might sound like just a weird group of us are doing all these things. But the truth is that we are all hyperconnected. My mother, who's so proud that she's not on Twitter and that she's not on Facebook, calls me in the morning to invite me to lunch at her house, then emails me after the call to remind me that I agreed to have lunch with her, and then sends me a text message right before the lunch just in case I forgot that we're having lunch, like mothers do. She is hyperconnected. She doesn't realize it. She jumps from one form of communication to the next completely transparently. So we're all hyperconnected, even if we don't realize it. But it's really interesting when we start to see this, of what can happen, right? When everything that can will be connected. Even things that initially don't seem that can be connected, like a glass of milk with a cell phone. Things that initially we don't see how they could be 
connected. And that will happen through some kind of interface. It doesn't really matter which technology, but for those of you interested, it could be a milk carton with an RFID chip that, says, that tells the refrigerator, I have a liter of milk. And each day, I take that carton out, and I pour myself a glass. And when I put it back, the refrigerator knows that I take 300 cc's every day. So after the third day, when I put the carton back, the refrigerator knows there's not enough milk so that I can have my glass the next morning. So thankfully, the refrigerator sends an email to my cell phone reminding me to buy milk. And we always hear about these futurologists telling us that refrigerators will make up our shopping list and tell us what we need to buy. Or better yet, they'll actually make the order with the, the supermarket and we'll get all the things we need delivered to our house. But when you start to understand hyperconnectivity, you start to see that this isn't futurology. This isn't something that could happen. You see that this will happen, and it's just a matter of time until it's cheap enough to put all this common activity and all this technology into the milk cartons and into the, into the refrigerator until it happens. So it's just a matter of time. 3.34 a.m. A time that is very symbolic for everyone in Chile, where I'm based. 3.34 a.m. was the time that the biggest earthquake in recent history hit Chile. 8.8 uh, Richter, sorry, sorry 8.8 .8 magnitude on the Richter scale. Buildings collapsed. Bridges cut off. Whole cities completely devastated by the following tsunami. But at 3.34 a.m., we didn't see those images. We just saw that the following day. At 3.34 a.m., this is all we knew. It was in the middle of the night, the light went out, we had no clue what was happening. Even worse, the most common ways of communication or means of communication, the phone, was completely collapsed and wasn't working. In my case, I didn't even consider using the phone. I jumped straight to Twitter. After obviously making sure that my pregnant wife was okay, I jumped straight to Twitter. And I wrote that in Spanish. So even before even reading Twitter, my first reaction was to share. And I'll translate that to you, for you. That more or less says, what the hell was that? So confusion. I had no clue what just happened. Everything moved, everything broke. What I did know was one little bit of information. I could stand um, on my terrace, I could look outside, and I could see that at least in Providencia, in my neighborhood, there was no light. And I could share that. I knew just that. And the beauty of Twitter is that you had hundreds of thousands of people that were sharing all those small bits of information. I obviously didn't uh, have the foresight to take a screenshot of Twitter at that same moment. So this is a screenshot of actually one of the replicas that came later. But it's the same, it's, it's the same example. You could add all those little bits of information, and you could start to see it wasn't just Providencia that didn't have light. It wasn't just Santiago. It was most of Chile. You could see from all the reports that the epicenter of the earthquake was somewhere in the south. You could tell pretty quickly that it was near Concepcion, and you could see how big and massive it had been. So we had a very good sense of what had happened a few minutes later, even though we were cut off from all other means of communication. And because I have lots of followers on Twitter, lots of people started asking me to retweet their messages, basically uh, share or forward what they were sending me to all the people who subscribed to my account. And most of their messages were, can someone please give me information about this small town where my father lives? Can someone please know if anything happened such and such place? So I just started to resend these messages. And through all these messages, suddenly a message shows up from a big TV station. And they say, Leo, can you please send us your phone? We want to call you and want to interview you. Obviously, after verifying that they were who they said they were, I sent them my cell phone, my number, sorry, and uh, even though all the phone lines were collapsed, I have no clue how this happened, but this call managed to get through, and a minute later, I was talking to CNN. This wasn't CNN Chile or CNN en Español, this was CNN International from Atlanta. And a few minutes later, Half an hour after the earthquake had happened, I was going out on the air, me or someone with a name similar to mine, as you can see it, and 
I was in my apartment, in the dark, in my pajamas, giving out all this information to CNN. The first phone contact that CNN did wasn't with uh, a government uh, representative, it wasn't from, with a journalist, it wasn't with, with uh, someone of their team uh, in Chile, or even CNN Español. It was with a guy from Twitter. And what I was doing was basically summarizing all these little bits of information that, I that we've been seeing on Twitter. In the middle of the call, the light came back in my house, so I turned on the TV and uh, tuned into CNN and actually took that, 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 that picture right there. So I saw that I was actually going live at that moment. And after the call ended, I switched to one of the, of the, of the national TV stations. This is actually the state-owned, state-run TV station. So in some sort of way, it's the official voice, right, of what was going on. And the host of the news program was repeating over and over again, a big earthquake just happened in Chile. We have no further information at the moment. A big earthquake just happened in Chile. We have no further information at the moment. And they just kept on repeating that. And I'd just been on CNN giving out all these little bits of information, and she was just repeating the same phrase over and over again. Again, sorry. And it's not because she didn't know what was going on. It's not because she didn't know that Twitter had all this information. But it's because she can't be as irresponsible as I was, that I could just repeat what I was reading on Twitter. She needed context. She needed confirmation of all those things that were being mentioned. And that's one of the big issues. When you have all these massive amounts of information that move as quickly as they do through Twitter, you can generate disinformation. You can actually generate confusion, which is very dangerous. And just like you need law and order forces in the real world sorry, in the real world to maintain order we needed the same thing online i actually remembered seeing a tweet that was saying riots are happening in the intersection of such and such street and that just happened to be the intersection near my house so i went out on my terrace and looked and there were no riots it was completely quiet nothing was happening but people were so scared and were so confused and had so little information that they were just sharing and retweeting all these things that no one really knew if they were real. And many of them were actually saying, the police are saying, so they were speaking in the name of the police, and you just retweet that, because you'd believe it was true. But the police wasn't on Twitter. And it's pretty amazing that a couple of hours later, they were. They moved incredibly fast, and in less than eight hours, they were on Twitter with a verified account. If you, have asked, if, if you had asked uh, most of us, what should the police, should they be on Twitter? What should they do on Twitter? None of us would have had an answer just a couple of days before the earthquake. But when something like this happens, you realize that you need these official sources on Twitter. It might not make sense in any random moment, but when crises happen, you need them. Not only Carabineros de Chile, which is the name of the Chilean police, but also the army. They were on Twitter with verified accounts, actually sending out official information and helping to separate the misinformation and confusion from the real uh, verified things that were happening. So to end this first part, first of all, today we're all hyperconnected. This isn't the trend, this isn't the future, this isn't what is going to happen. This is what's happening today. Second, because we're hyperconnected, we just jump from one means of communication to the next. It's completely transparent to us. So we can't just be on one means of communication. Your audience isn't just on one place. They jump from one to the next. It's completely transparent. And they expect you to be in all those places. Because if you're not in, those, in, all, in, in, in all those places, they will fill those information voids, the information gaps. So we need official sources. If not, the people themselves will just fill it with information that is not confirmed or unofficial. I'm not a journalist, and up until very re recently, I knew very little about media. What I did know is what an audience member or a user of media knows, right? A consumer of content knows. And I'd always been frustrated by the way that media works or has worked up until now almost everywhere in the world. Or actually, no, still works almost everywhere around the world. And this example here, it's a very easy example to explain, but it, just, it doesn't just happen with this one TV channel. It's just one example that happens everywhere in every single country with most media networks. This TV channel claims to be fair and balanced, real journalism, and that they report and we decide. 
And actually, they put all those three things in one same ad. Real journalism. Fair and balanced. We report, you decide. They actually put all those three statements in one same ad. That's what they claim to be. And everyone who knows Fox News knows that that really isn't so. We all know that this gentleman is behind Fox News and that he has a specific agenda. He has an editorial bias that he likes to push. And he can do it. It's his, his TV channel. He can do whatever he wants with that TV channel. People decide if they want to watch it or not. But the thing is that that is what always annoyed me, that they try to claim that they're objective, that they're independent, that they're not biased, when we all know that they are. And it's not just Fox News. This happens everywhere, in every single city, newspapers, radio stations, TV channels. We know they're biased. We know if they're pro or against the government. We know their political agenda. We know it all. But they all claim to be independent, which is funny because they're transparent. You can really see beyond that, even though they claim to be so. And even new media is really replicating the old model, right? They try to make us believe that they're the new way of doing things, but they're all repeating the same old way of doing it. And even the very popular Huffington Post has the name of its owner in the name of this media property. So it, there's always an owner behind the media properties with their own editorial view. It can be as independent as they want to be, but they can't help it. They always have the owner's view behind it. So new media is really the same way of doing it over and over again. And I've always been a huge fan of technology growing up. I used to love reading as much as I could about technology. And recently, I started to get more and more frustrated with all the tech journalism that I could find. Because anywhere around the world, again, this doesn't happen just in one place or another, Everyone, everywhere around the world, it really wasn't tech journalism, it was just printing press releases. And you'd read three different newspapers and you'd see the same press release with the words changed, but it was the same thing. Sony would come out with a new computer and everyone would just say, Sony came out with a new computer. It wouldn't tell you, beware of this computer, there have been issues reported around the world with their battery, they'd just say, a new computer came out. But you'd look on, on, on message boards and all these underground places on the internet and you'd see all this other uh, amount of information that wasn't covered. And that frustration, one day, with no projection, with no ambition, made me want to start my own tech blog. Again, I just started writing one night. I really didn't know what I was doing. There was no big project, no big dream. I didn't want to become the biggest tech site anywhere around the world. I just wanted to write real opinions about technology. Mine, and be completely transparent that they were mine. These are not independent. This is what I think. And because in those days, today there's this Apple craze and everyone, every single, uh, Everyone's talking about Apple day and night, but in those days they didn't. They just talked about Microsoft. I've always been a Mac user for, for 20 years, so I wanted to talk more about Mac. No one was talking about it. And most of my friends use Linux, so I wanted to talk more about Linux and the open source movement. So I, bunch of, I invited a bunch of friends, and we started to talk about these technologies that no one talked about. And as you know, Mac and Linux aren't really part of the same group. Actually, Linux users hate Mac users. Mac users don't understand Linux users. So we actually got both points of views. We, we could say we aren't independent. We have this guy loving Linux and this guy loving Mac, and each one will give their point of view. But you could, you could see the honesty. There was no one trying to say this is trying to be objective. Also, we started doing real reviews. I would buy the products myself, and I would write what I thought about the product as honestly as I could, and trying to uh, measure the good and the bad, not just focus on one or the other. I remember one time I actually hired three different broadband providers to my house so I could write about the three different broadband providers, and not just the speed. I actually reported the whole thing. I'm currently calling this guy. The phone call is taking an hour. This other guy, I could do it on the website, and it took me 15 minutes. This guy installed in 24 hours, he was in my place and arrived on time. This other company took two weeks to arrive, and even the day that they were supposed to arrive, arrived late. 
So it was the whole process, not just the speed, not just the price. You generally see someone talking about comparing the different broadband services, and it was just price or speed. Here, you, I, I was talking about the whole process, what a, what a person really wants to know when they want to select one of these different providers. And because of especially the first part, and not on purpose, well, not really so much on purpose, we were very anti-Windows. We were just tired, being Mac and Linux users, we were just tired that everyone was talking about Windows being the only thing in the world. So we'd actually feature all the bad things about Windows and Microsoft so that they understood the reason that we decided something different. And we started to become slowly popular because of all these different things, all these weird things that we were starting to do. And suddenly we got a call from our first advertiser. We made no money for the first two years, absolutely none. And suddenly we get an email from our first advertiser. And amazingly, that email was from Microsoft. <laughs> I remember getting the email and asking my friends, have these guys read Firewire? Do they know that we speak against them every single day? And I was like, okay, freedom of speech. We are allowed to say what we believe in. We'll give this space, the advertising space, so that the advertiser can say whatever they believe in, just as long as it's not some illegal or uh, something that, 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 that really... Um, you get the point. So, uh, we received the campaign, we put it up on the website, and as you can imagine, the backlash from the users was immense. How could you do this? You sell out the company that you hate, you allowed them to advertise and give you money, uh, you're just like all the rest. And I really believe that what we were doing was the only way. We needed, we, it, it'd be great to have advertisers and live off this, but we wouldn't stop doing what we were doing of, of speaking our minds and hearts, what we really thought about all these things. So. I wrote an editorial, which really doesn't make sense in a blog because every single post is really editorial, but in this case it was the first letter to our readers, right? And I said, I explained all this, so we, content and advertising will always be independent, this is, a this is a place where we can write about what we believe in, and this is a place that advertisers can write about it. Having said that, the campaign that you, say, that you see here, right next to this article, isn't endorsed or supported by us because we believe that these are untrue facts, very imprecise, and blah, 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 blah. I kept on saying all the reasons that we were against the advertising campaign that was right there on our site. Obviously, Microsoft called immediately, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? We're taking this campaign off your site immediately. You won't get a single cent from us. And the campaign was gone. Three months later, Microsoft was back. And the incredible thing is that today we have a bunch of advertisers and they all understood that the only way that they can reach our audience is understanding that sometimes their advertising is going to show up next to content that doesn't uh, agree with them or uh, doesn't uh, actually talks against their, their same product. It took us time, but eventually it happened. And many brands still don't get it, but most of them have started to understand that it has to work this way. I have to remember which slide comes now. Ah, so, other things, other incredible things started to happen. So this is early on, okay, and it starts to, to grow. Suddenly, a friend sends me a link from an online cartoon from Argentina. Again, I was based in Santiago in Chile. I wasn't planning on something to even go beyond the city I was in. And suddenly, from a, a, a neighboring country, an online cartoon, the main character of the online cartoon suddenly says, I'm gonna go check Firewire. I'm like, how is Firewire showing up on this cartoon? Another friend sends me a link to a fashion editorial on a women's blog, and suddenly there was this girl jumping in the air with a Firewire t-shirt. I didn't have Firewire t-shirts. How did, how, I couldn't believe that they actually printed one for this fashion shoot. Another friend goes to, I always get told these things by friends. Another friend goes to New York and he's at AdTech at this big advertising conference. The CEO of Kodak is up on stage giving the keynote speech and he's talking about how media has changed, how advertising has changed, how communication has changed. And he says, for example, the first mention of our new printer showed up on a blog in Chile. And he puts up this slide. 
My friend grabs his cell phone and says, Oh my god, Firewire is up on... Firewire was on the big screen on this huge stage in New York. I remember getting this email and I couldn't get it. How did Firewire get there? I was in my house. This was my hobby. This is the thing I did at night. A reader from Guatemala made it this, this bracelet and sent it through postal mail with a note saying, from a fan in Guatemala, keep doing what you're doing. We love Firewire. We were getting fan mail. I mean, like traditional fan mail, not emails. It was incredible. People were really reacting to what we were doing. Not only people. At the end of 2007, Firewire became, well, before that, Firewire became the most popular blog in Chile. Then it became the third most popular blog in Latin America, the second. And around the end of 2007, it started to become, and finally became, the most popular blog in Latin America. I always like to mention this, but between the, that orange dot and the blue dot, there's actually another blog in between that I don't put up here. And it's a blog for adults. It's a porn blog. We were more popular than porn. And not only that, we were getting mentioned as a source in media all around the world. One of our partners came back from a trip to India with one of those free newspapers, and he opens it up, puts it on my desk, and says, look. And I start reading, and I didn't get it. I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. He said, keep on, keep, keep reading. And I get to the end of the article, and at the end of the article it said, source Firewire. And I couldn't believe it. Some free newspaper in India was using Firewire, the Spanish-speaking blog halfway around the world, as a source. And one of the reasons that all these things started to happen, that users loved it, that it became very popular, and it started to be influential as well to other media, was the way that we managed our site. And one of those things is what we call the octopus. Like any media property, we want people to go to our site, to be a destination, right? But we know that our community exists beyond our sites, that they're on Facebook, on Twitter, on their cell phone. So what we do is we actually allow them to read our content wherever they want. They, you can actually subscribe to Firewire through email and you'll get the full content of Firewire in your email every day. Not just the headlines, not a summary, the full content. You can read Firewire without going, without ever going to Firewire. So we don't force, we don't make you go to Firewire. And the beauty of that, and this is one of the great things, this is not something we invented. This is the nature of the internet. This is how it works. People just keep on sharing. They retweet, they, they like, they forward that email, so people have turned into our marketing strategy. Not only do we give them the technical tools to be able to share our content everywhere, but we also give them the legal permission to do so. So we have this non-proprietary content model where we actually allow anyone to copy and paste our content wherever they want. So while some media properties are suing each other because you used my image and you used a paragraph of my content, we actually encourage people to use our content wherever they want. And that has caused that when we talk about 8 million people a month, we're talking about the amount of people that go to our sites, directly to the sites. Because that's the, indus the industry standard. You talk about your visits. But our audience is exponentially much larger. Just RSS, which is this alternative channel, we have over double the amount of people daily, these are daily numbers, uh, on, on, uh, on this alternative channel. So we reach a much bigger audience than the amount of people that we're talking about, specifically on the site. And because of that, we got interviewed by a blog called Internet Evolution that's sponsored by IBM, and they headlined the article, The Anti-Murdochs of Latin America. And you can obviously imagine that I love that, that quote. We're working with a goal. We're trying to reach a dream that we have. This all started out of a project one night with no ambition, no dream. But it started to grow and grow to something quite large. So now we're working with something, some place that we want to reach. And the dream that we have, what we want to do, is that we want to revolutionize the way that mass media works. And we want to do that by changing the way that the power structure in the industry works. And I don't have to explain that because we've just seen all those examples and you understand what I mean by the power structure in the industry. And the thing is that, how are we going to avoid it? Bitacita has owners. We can't help but have our own editorial views. Even though you try to be independent, you will always have your opinion. And you can try to have as many 
objective opinions, sorry, subjective opinions, so really understand that they're coming from different places, but how will you decide how to feature one or the other? And we're going to do that through UGC, through user-generated content. And we're not talking about the, U the kind of UGC that you find on YouTube. YouTube is a great database of videos. YouTube is a terrible, terrible TV channel. I don't know why I'm so tongue-tied today. YouTube is a terrible TV channel. It's a great database for videos. So we're trying to do UGC for media, editorially. If we really want to revolutionize the way this works, if we really want to democratize the exchange of information, first we need to reach as many people as possible, wherever they are and however we can. So we can't um, discriminate because you have one operating system. Oh no, we only work on Mac. Oh no, we only work on computers. We have to be on as many devices as possible. All you have is access to email, no problem. You can read us just via email. And we have to move from this editorial model to allowing anyone to be able to create an article on our sites, absolutely anyone. And obviously that generates lots of fear. What happens when you have anyone generating content on your site? So I'll get to that in a minute. Not only people giving us content, but also being able to give you the best context possible from all our sites. So you can be reading about the iPhone on Firewire, and we'll have all the classified ads from our classified ad site, for, of the iPhones for sale in your city, and we also have the video games for iPhone from our video game community. Obviously, not only our sites. Why stop there? So grab the content from all the other relevant places where you can get content that is relevant to what you're reading. Twitter, Facebook, Flickr, YouTube will give you the information, will filter it, and will tell you this is all the relevant. These are the relevant videos, the relevant classified ads, the relevant information that you need for the content that you're, con that you're currently consuming. And that's when we reach the issue of content quality. Obviously, the huge issue with UGC. And the way that we're working on that, we've been working on, 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 on an algorithm for a year, an algorithm that we call Karma. It's not a very original name, but people understand what it means. Because you have both sides. You can have content, and we are able to understand which content needs to be pushed to the front page, and which content it needs to be buried or eliminated as spam from the site, and which content goes in between. But not only up or down, we also have left or right. And I don't mean that in the political sense. I mean that categorizing where that should go. Because you might want to write an article for Firewire, because Firewire is the most popular blog, but maybe what you just wrote is more relevant to the women's lifestyle community or to even to the sports community. So we have to be able to understand where that content has to go, not only how valuable or how high the quality of that content is. And once you start understanding where it has to go, you also understand what goes together. And that's what allows us to be able to contextually relate all this. And we do that not through artificial intelligence, but through, the, through understanding the environment. If we wanted to do it through artificial intelligence, we'd need NASA-level funding and many, many years to be able to really understand the content. But when you do it by understanding and measuring and reading what your users do directly and indirectly, it's amazing how much you can learn. Today, we actually have prototypes working, and they've been very successful in analyzing this content, and actually Currently, they're making the same mistakes that a human being would do when you have an article about a video game and you're not sure if, or even better, a console, and you don't know if that video game console should go on Firewire, the tech blog, or on the video game community. So the same kind of mistakes that a human would do when they're trying to know where that content goes. But obviously, we're still working on that and want to reach even better, and the idea is to help out the humans. So. I want to end with this slide. Today we are hyperconnected. This is not the future, this is not a trend, this is not something that's going to happen. And we jump from one device to the other. We jump from text to video to audio. We don't think about radio or TV or print anymore. Just We only think about that when we're using all these specific devices. But when we start to use internet on all the devices, it's the same thing for all of us. It's one big hypermedia for this hyper-connected world. And that's today. That's not tomorrow. That's not the future. Thank you.